Well, it's five o'clock now. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the EANS webinar on um, spinal cord injury. It's a great pleasure to start and to introduce. My name is Andreas Unterberg. I'm chair and director of the Department of Neurosurgery in Heidelberg in Germany. And um, I have been told by Anna from the EANS office in Brussels that there is a great interest uh, of many of you to listen to the um, upcoming and following presentations by three speakers. And um, we would like to give you an update on surgical, medical and experimental treatment of spinal cord injury. The three speakers will be Basem Isak. He is a young, fully trained neurosurgeon from Heidelberg. The second one will be Professor Weitner. He is a neurologist and um, chairing and directing the Department of Paraplegiology in the Department of Orthopedics and Trauma Surgery in Heidelberg. And the third speaker will be Alexander Junzi. He is also a young neurosurgeon interested in spinal cord and um, cerebral trauma. And um, we will start with Basem Isak. He will talk about the surgical um, perspectives. Um, Dr. Isak trained in Heidelberg and after completion of his training, he went to Seattle, joining Professor Chapman as the Swedish Institute for clinical and experimental research on, on spine. And now he came back, did his habilitation in German, which is corresponding to the PhD in Europe and is now um, guiding the section on um, spine surgery in our department here in Heidelberg. Now, Dr. Isak, it's all yours. You should talk about surgical treatment, the actual update um, of course, spinal cord injury is the main topic. It's all yours now. Thank you, Professor Underberg, for this very kind introduction and a cordial welcome to all participants and listeners. Um, the EANS is a great and a huge platform. It's always a big pleasure to present and to give a good presentation. So on my part, it's the surgical treatment of SCI. So, and before we start with the surgical things you're all interested in, we just go through a few slides um, of epidemiology. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Um, for the, I apologize to interrupt. And um, this is just for a technical note, a remark. Um, I got it on my um, paper here because I was told to um, tell the uh, listeners and joiners of our webinar that there is, of course, time for questions and discussion. And please write your questions in the Q&A section, and then we will be able to look it up and to answer your questions, um, hopefully um, quickly. And um, don't use the chat. Um, the chat will only be used for informal um, technical uh, purposes. So I apologize again and again, um, Dr. Isaac starts on surgical treatment of spinal cord injury. Thank you very much. So as we mentioned and said before, we just want to give a few slides about epidemiology. It's, I don't want to bore you, but some things are a kind of interest. Um, the typical SCI patient today is a male patient over 80%. We know this from recently published studies. Um, they are in their mid forties and we will listen later on and uh, we'll know that patients, for instance, with ankylosing spondylitis who have SCI are older aged. Um, it's often a vehicle crash and um, with almost 40% and almost one third is falls can either be a simple fall or fall downstairs or fall from ladders. And cervical spine is most often involved in over 50%, but take in mind that we do not want to miss out the thoracolumbar SCI and uh, most often incomplete T3 
tetraplegia or paraplegia occurs. But we have the Asia impairment scale, which is validated. And um, this is, I think, a great tool to have. But before we want to talk about surgery or great surgical um, procedures, we just need to know that we always need a first line care because we know from um, guidelines and they're almost like, uh, published in 2013 that we have always to secure the airway, breathing, circulation, and of course, the spinal immo immobilization. And we have to uh, give large volume intravenous fluid therapy. Um, and what we also have to take in mind is that during the acute injury, systemic hypertension um, below 90 millimeter mercury uh, is associated with worse neurologic outcomes. Um, early imaging, of course, using CT or MRI scans, which are available 24 seven and um, ICU management. And um, what do we do on this ICU when the patient arrives? We always monitor the respiratory, hemodynamic, and cardiac function. Um, we have to maintain adequate spinal cord perfusion. We have to have uh, mean arterial pressure above 85 to 90 millimeters mercury post-injury because this has shown an improvement in Asia grade of at least one grade for patients for the first seven days post-injury. Of course, oxygen saturation should be maintained above 90%. And of course, the venous thrombosis prophylaxis should be administered as soon as possible. And just uh, again, just one or two slides, just why ICU? Because we know from the literature that incidence of hypertension after cervical STI at arrival to the emergency department is 25.8%. And the incidence of a typical neurogenic shock was 19.3% and cardiovascular disturbances are the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in both acute and chronic phases of STI and the impairment of autonomic nervous control systems in patients with high STI cervical or high thoracic causes cardiac dysrhythmias. So, and um, what we always want to know and what we ask for is uh, what about cortisone or mature prednisolone? alone? And uh, we know from a recently published study in 2017, that uh, a high dose of 24 hour regime of MPSS confers a small positive benefit of long term motor recovery when administered within eight hours of injury. But on the other hand, the decision not to use high dose MPSS for treatment of a specific spinal cord injury cannot be interpreted as lack of treatment. Between us, um, to administer cortisone or prednisolone. Um, in a young patient, um, I've never seen one who died due to pneumonia. So, I mean, you can take this in mind, but we don't have evidence for that. And then I'm um, a spine. I think this is the main goal we have to know and we have to take into account early decompressive surgery is indicated within 24 hours. There are several studies available which um, determined early decompression within 24. 24 to 48 and 48 to 72 hours. And we've seen that early decompression within a 24 hour window is beneficial. And it also has been proven that it is safe and associated with improved neurologic outcome defined at at least two grade AIS improvement at six months follow up. And then now the surgical uh, things are asked, and the surgeon is. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, the main person after everything has cleared the ICU, the stabilization, but we have to decide is it stable or unstable? I mean, this, I mean, decompression is clear, but can we leave it as it is or do we have to do further procedures? It's always a huge question and um, therefore we have classifications. I mean, this is a useful and of course a helpful tool to determine stability or instability. Just to mention a few, we know we have many classification systems, at least for the cervical spine. We have the classification of the condyle fractures according to Hawkins. We have the Atlanto um, axial rotatory subluxation um, classification. We have the hangman fractures classification according to Effendi. Uh, just like the two most common cervical classification systems, just uh, you have heard that it's like the Gewaila 
type classification it's uh, <clears throat> Um, yeah, it's a, this is, it has five types. Um, the anterior arc, which is k valid F1. The posterior arc is k valid F2. Both are stable. Then you have the Jefferson fracture. It's a combination of both, anterior and posterior, but it's not always unstable. This uh, has to um, correlate with a transverse atlantal ligament. If you have a rupture or a bony avulsion of the transverse atlantal ligament, you see right down here, then it's unstable. Otherwise, this may be treated with a rigid collar. And then you have the, the Gewala type 4 fracture. It's like a lateral mass fracture on both sides, which also can be treated conservatively, depends on the dislocation. And of course, the Gewala type 5 fracture, which is um, located at the transverse processes on both sides. Um, then the classic odontoid fracture classification, Anderson and Alonso, with an oblique fracture through the odontoid tip, which is type one, generally stable, soft collar, six to eight weeks. Then you have the very common um, odontoid type two fracture through the base of the dent. This is the, the weakest spot, especially in the elderly. And we have seen in the past two decades an increase in elderly patients with an unstable odontoid type two fracture. And these are almost 75%. And the type three fracture, which is um, through the axis, and this is highly unstable in almost one third or 25%, but this can, if there is no dislocation, be um, treated with a rigid collar. So, and uh, because um, we have so many classifications and we don't have all these classifications available immediately, um, there are newer classifications who like summarized all available classifications, especially for the cervical spine, where we have many classification systems. It's the AO spine upper cervical injury classification system, where they summarize the occipital condyle and the cranio-cervical junction, the C1 ring, the C1-2 joint, and the C2 and C2-3 joints. And uh, what we can take into account is that A is the bone injury. You see here on the First uh, line, yeah, it's bony, stable. Then you have the type two where band or ligamentous injury occurs. This is either stable or unstable. Uh, this is some kind of gray zone, we would call that. And of course, the translational injury, the type C is unstable, but I guess without any classification system, every one of us will know that this is highly unstable and needs further surgical treatment. Uh, the same is true for the area below this C2, C3 area, also from the AO spine summarized with all available classification systems so far, where you have a type A compression injury. It's actually similar to the thoracal lumbar classification, but they have a separate one for the subaxial cervical spine. It's a, a compression injury, which is type A. You see this on the left side. Um, it's either stable or unstable. I mean, we can say if the, the posterior wall is involved, this may be unstable and needs further surgical treatment. The type B is a distraction injury where we all know it's unstable and the type C, a translational injury. The same is true for that. It's unstable and needs further surgical treatment. And then we have the thoracal lumbar injury classification. Well, I guess I would say we're all familiar with that. It's a, just type A is bony injury only, so therefore stable. And then when the tension band and the ligamentous injury also, especially of the posterior parts of the uh, vertebral bodies um, are involved, it's either stable or unstable. And of course, type C are the translational injuries, whether you have a three-dimensional dislocation. As you've seen, we have some parts in the classification where it's not clear, is it stable or unstable? If you have a four fracture for, at the thoracal lumbar junction um, with involvement of the posterior wall, a so-called complete burst fracture, there is a helpful tool which has been published by Alexander Vaccaro in 2017. And um, this is actually for those cases where they uh, validated this classification according to an international renowned committee. And um, they had a consensus and um, they found out that like patients with 
below four points do not need surgical treatment and patients with four to five points need surgical treatment and patients with over five points need surgical treatment. For example, if you have like uh, an A4 fracture and a, a neurological status is, they have neurologic injury and it's not zero, this means they have some kind of deficit, of course, surgery is indicated, right? Uh, they have, so you have to bring the neurology, but I, I think it's clear for us, yes. If a patient has a fracture, either stable or unstable, if they have neurology, this should be treated surgically, of course, decompressed and then stabilized when instability occurs. Yeah. But this is like a useful tool you can use if it's like a so-called gray zone, you don't know, yeah, stable or unstable. I mean, decompression may or may not be clear, but if you need like a guideline, if to do surgery or not, you can use this classification and take the neurology into account. So, and now what are the goals of surgery? after acute SCI, of course, stabilize the injured spine, decompress the spinal cord, preservation of neurological functions and prevention of further damage. Especially patients, they may be stable, they are like unstable, stable, not clear, do not have neurology. We have a bit time, but then if dislocation occurs, it will be unstable and the patient will have potentially neurological damage afterwards. And a case example, and um, this is the odontoid fracture. As you see on the left side, a patient presents after a simple fall from flipping at home um, with neck pain afterwards. With you see the scap here, it's the odontoid type 2 fracture. And you see there's no dislocation. And um, this was initially treated conservatively um, externally. And then they came to us with further neck pain. And then we did a CT image and see that dislocation occurs. And of course, without any classification system and without calling the attending, it is clear that this is an unstable fracture. And this is a 88 year old female, but still Asia E. Yeah, so we don't have, still do not have a deficit, but this patient needs surgical treatment. And um, of course, we, first of all, the intraop reduction. Um, we put on a Mayfield's clamp and then gently reduce the fracture under x-ray. Yeah, if you have, for instance, a Gartner-Wells system or you have a system where you can put kilogram by kilogram for the reduction, you can use this, but we can, we can get also without monitoring a good result of the reduction by gently reducing the fracture using permanent extra imaging. And what we did is a posterior C1 fusion. You see here, we use the foam technique. We published on that in 2017, the posterior arc lateral master, especially for patients who are older age, this is safe because you don't need to dive into the epidural venous plexus. You don't get into conflict with the C2 nerve roots on both sides. And you, of course, have to see the vitreal artery or at least know where it is. And you can do this very safe using spinal navigation and receive great results. Another patient, 76-year-old um, patient, um, who also had an accidental fall at home, he um, uh, got an incomplete SCI with an Asia C status. And what we... First of all, see on the extra on the left side, it's a um, degenerated C spine with um, anterior osteophytes. And an additional performed MRI scan receives uh, not only a listesis here, but also high uh, grade stenosis on both levels. And you also see signs of myelopathy. Um, what we did with this uh, patient was a two level ACDF, C4 to C6, using a cage with an integ with integrated screw to improve stabilization because we've seen the list of this and we do not want to insert a plate because we all know that patients with older age receiving a plate will have dysphagia, postoperativity, and you have to drill down the osteophytes, um, which will take longer OR time and um, could potentially cause more morbidity. And we did this patient within 24 hours as recommended. And uh, at least he recovered from Asia C to Asia D 
upon discharge. Uh, this time, a young patient, not always the old ones, a 47-year-old male patient involved in a high-speed MVA um, with a T5 fracture. It's a T5 fracture. We can see it on the left side in this emergency performed CT scan. We have um, this vertebral body who has some kind of fracture line, and then the, the trauma went through all posterior elements at small high levels. Um, and uh, this patient uh, had um, a complete spinal cord injury, an Asia C, in, sorry, an Asia A uh, grade. And you see here the emergently done MRI with edema all the way in the muscles in the ligamentous and band structures. And what you see here on the right lower image is some kind of section of the myelin. Yeah, so we have, we already see changes and something happened there. And after we, we, we did this also within 24 hours and performed emergency surgery. And what we found after multi-level laminectomies, um, like the, the dura mater was like uh, open in all directions and uh, the myelin was transected. So it was clear after we've seen those images that um, this patient will not recover after surgery. And uh, what we did was a posterior fusion from T2 to T7 with multi-level laminectomy to see on this side. And um, what you also see that we always go for the largest screw available and often they are as large as the pedicles. The, the larger the screws, the more stable. Uh, it's not dependent on the length, what we know from literature, but the thickness is very important. And um, we always use CT navigation, and you cannot do this with this diameter and this trauma without navigation. This is my opinion. And uh, what we said, no neurological re recovery occurred. Another 86-year-old male patient. This is a patient who had a known history of neck pain and also slipped at home. And the, the cervical CT scan revealed a impression fracture of the end plates. And uh, we see some kind of fragment um, going through the myelin and the MRI receive, uh, revealed an uh, edema, it's a myelopathy. And he had an incomplete SCI with an HRT grade. And um, what we did was an anterior fusion from C4 to C6 with a corpectomy on C5. And this patient recovered fully after six months. I just want to show that there are many ways to do surgery. It's not always the anterior, the posterior, or the combined anterior posterior. At least it has to be stable, and um, you can decide which is the right thing for the patient. And uh, what I always would go for is like invasiveness. Um, for instance, if you have very sick patients, try to do minim minimal invasive procedures. Um, yeah, this is a, some kind of pitfalls you have to take into account. And another example is a 32-year-old male patient who had a downhill bike crash. He um, was fully protected, but um, yeah, the, the, still the trauma was too high. And he revealed it to one fracture. It's a type C fracture. We have a a dislocation, we have a translation, and we see that the force went all from anterior to posterior uh, with a fracture of the spinous process, and he had an incomplete spinal cord injury with either C. And um, we decided to do a um, reduction to realign the spine with a C4 to T3 fusion. And what we also did, because it was a young patient, and we did a T1 copectomy through a sternotomy from anterior. And you can see the results um, here in the lower part of the slide uh, where we insert an anterior plate right close to the screw. And you see here also the pedicles are so small, but we still go always for the biggest screw available. And this patient um, recovered fully after three months. So we achieved not only a radi radiographic great result, also a neurological, very, very acceptable results. And um, what we mentioned a couple of times before, and don't forget, we don't have only spinal cord injury at the cervical or half thoracic spine. We also have the, the mid to lower thoracic spine and the thoracolumbar junction. 
And what we know is that um, patients with ankylosing spondylitis have an increased rate of STI because of the increased incidence of vertebral fractures. <clears throat> These factors combined with a highly un unstable spine, as we all know, and it is predisposed to a highly distracted injury. And we have spinal epidural hematomas in 60% of cases. Um, the SEI may further increase in this population, the so-called delayed spinal cord injury. And uh, this management of um, ang spondy fractures in this alter cohort is always challenging because we do not only have a highly unstable um, spine, we also have um, very um, complicated and very morbid patients. So um, in this case, um, or in patients with ang spondy, you always have to go for a large surgery to stabilize uh, the spine to avoid a pivot point. If you do not go too high or too low, this pivot point will break um, this spine again. And um, we often see the gap in between and uh, some surgeons prefer to insert a cage, but this is not necessary. We know from recent studies, we know from internationally known opinions that it's not necessary. The gap can be left as it is. Um, do surgery as good as possible, um, probably use MIS techniques, but leave the gap as it is. And um, the patient, it's not already published, but uh, our department worked on that. We revealed a mortality rate of 30% in very elderly patients after three months. And finally, be always prepared. Be, be prepared for the worst case scenario. And I promise you, you will get this call in the middle of the night, not regularly where you have your specialist in house in the middle of the night. An older lady, 83 years old, um, this happened here, um, had multiple spine surgeries, not here, somewhere else, um, anterior a couple times and then posterior, and then um, came to us emergency, uh, emergently with an uh, with an emergency department. And um, this patient had a um, T2 burst fracture, a so-called DJK, D distal junction failure, with an acute SCI, incomplete SCI, with an HRD status. And um, what I want to say, okay, um, we are, it's in the middle of the night, we can do surgery, we can at least decompress, but don't do this in the middle of the night. You need an optimal setting, an optimal logistics, and we have 24 hours. There is no evidence to do this within eight hours. You may or may not give cortisone in younger patients who may have something like that in within eight hours, but there's no necessity to do surgery in the middle of the night because it's a highly, highly complex case. And you need not only to decompress, you need to realign the spine. And of course, this patient is 83 years old. You need an optimal anesthesiological management, sometimes many anesthesiologists in-house. And what has been done was a complex revision surgery with a transpedicular TT corpectomy, like for T2, it's always difficult to do a classic costal transvasectomy due to the scapula, but um, a small mesh cage through transpedicular is always a, a good uh, possibility, and then extend this construct to T9. And this is nothing you will start at 3 a.m. in the morning. So in conclusion, what we do need is an optimal pre-hospital and hospital logistics. You need an ICU setting with respiratory, hemodynamic, and cardiac monitoring. You never know what happens. Some patients with an acute cervical SEI come. Everything is, is okay. Within a couple of hours, um, uh, you see a worsened, worsened situation. Early surgical decompression within 24 hours. Use a classification system in your daily clinical practice. You can print this out. Pocket cards are available. Um, you, the more you use it, the more familiar you will get with that. Um, surgical therapy must be adapted individually. Do it posterior, do it MIS, do it anteriorly, do it combined. So um, this has to be adapted. And of course, a concerted interdisciplinary effort is favorable as always in spine medicine. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to hear some questions. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, Dr. Isaac, many thanks for this um, surgical contribution. Um, 
for the uh, update of um, spinal cord injury treatment. There are a lot of questions already in the uh, Q&A section. And uh, if I may gather uh, some of them, um, for example, Jan Lodin is asking, what do you think about multi-level laminectomy, durotomy, and myelotomy in cases of spinal cord injury with edema? So really aggressive um, decompression of the spinal cord. Um, and another um, anonymous question, what is the indication for decompression by or in patients um, that cannot by, be directly um, investigated who are comatose? So again, how radical should the decompression sh uh, be? And a question by the chair of our trauma section, Niklas Marklund from Lund in Sweden, what is the role for ultra early decompression? The question is, um, is it sufficiently fast within 24 hours or should it be done as early as possible? So these are questions, how radical, how aggressive decompression should be done in the ultra early stage. And your case three is somehow corresponding and somehow answering the question already, but maybe a quick statement from you again. Okay, thank you very much, uh, you three, for these great questions. I hope I can remember those questions. Uh, for me, it's always difficult, but let's start with the first, um, not anonymous question, um, like myelotomy, durotomy. Um, we know that and uh, we know people who've done that. We have not done this because um, there has been a scientific work on that topic. Like the edema expand the dura to like, we know this like from neurosurgery with hemicranectomy, edema and hemi um, in um, infarction. But for the spinal cord injury, it has not been proven that this brings a benefit. We also do not know if this worsened, but a benefit, uh, it, cannot be performed. Um, you can split the myelin, you can extend the dura using artificial stuff, but um, there is no benefit. The second question was, um, I guess, multi-level decompression with laminectomies, what we think about um, multi-level laminectomies. I think in this case, maybe we're not a very aggressive with myelotomy and durotomy, but multi-level decompression is in our opinion uh, very beneficial um, because, um, for instance, if you have epidural hematomas, if you have probably edema, we don't know if this is like scientific proven, but um, from our opinion, uh, multi-level laminectomies is beneficial, um, but we do not have evidence for that. The third question <clears throat> was again, uh, what was it? I lost the last question. Um, it was, what was the last, the third question again? Indication for decompression in patients who are not to be um, are comatose because they are comatose. Yeah, the thing is, um, the pitfall in this is like the patient is comatose, you cannot assess this patient, but you always have some kind of imaging, either a CT or probably if you're in a large hospital MRI scan. If you see there is instability, instability, if you see there is um, hematoma, if you see there is any kind of compression please treat this patient surgically if possible. Of course, if he's cortically and respiratory stable, please address this case also surgically when this is okay for the patient, because once the patient is awake, probably in days or weeks, then all is gone. You know, you, you lose a lot of time and especially the important time. So please treat this patient. And again, I remember the second part of this question, ultra early decompression within eight hours. There are studies, and I know there is a study, a study from Austria, I guess published within one or two years before where they try to figure out is there a difference between eight and 24 hours? There is not a difference. So 24 hours is the goal and um, higher is not good and below 24 hours is not beneficial. 
Yes, thank you, Dr. Isaac. There was another question exactly concerning this issue by Alice Hachel. Um, recently, there have been two meta-analyses on urgent decompression within eight hours after SCI with neurological improvement, especially in complete. Any comments on that? Maybe just a... Um, yeah, I, I know this meta-analysis very well. I mean, let's say from a logistic point, if like this um, can be done within eight hours, you can do it. But if we say we want to have um, evidence for that, we want to have proven mechanisms for that, it's not clear. This is the statement to that. Then there are two more questions, very brief questions. Um, um, type three odontoid fractured mentioned as unstable question marks. Uh, yes, of course, it's, um, it's an unstable fracture and okay. um, um, yeah, okay. it's, it's and, clear. Um, uh, another question, um, steroids? Um, we know we can administer within eight hours when we go for literature, but I personally, I would not, um, I would give young patients steroids, even if it's not within eight hours, because I do not think, and I haven't seen or heard that young patients died from pneumonia or get a septic shock if you gave them steroids. And we do this commonly, and we haven't seen any adverse events here at our department. And also a very short final question, because we then we have to move to the next speaker. Uh, role of immobilization yeah, on treatment. It's not treatment, but let's say conservation of cervical injury where no facilities for surgery. Of, of course, if you do not have the, the specialist, if you do not have the capacity, of course you have to immobilize the spine with a rigid collar, you don't have any other chances, but you have to take or bring this patient to a larger hospital who can treat that. But of course, um, surgery is indicated in unstable situations. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Isaac. Um, I think we have to move on for time constraints and um, move to the next speaker. Maybe you look also into the Q&A section and uh, try to answer again um, in, um, yeah, in written words the, uh, answer th the answers uh, you couldn't give. And um, now I would like to switch to the second speaker, who is uh, Professor Weidner. I introduced him very briefly already in the beginning. He's a neurologist working in the Department of Orthopedic surgery, trauma surgery, and paraplegiology. That's his field. And he is very um, renowned, internationally known. He did his studies in Würzburg, did a postdoc uh, fellowship in San Diego in the Department of Neurosciences, then moved on to Regensburg, um, also a German uh, university city, well known where he um, um, was as a, a consultant for neurology and then finally got a chair here in Heidelberg in 2009 and he's focusing on paraplegiology and um, I would like to welcome him and uh, would like to thank him very much and he would now um, give his thoughts and views on of course conservative treatment, rehabilitation and conservative management of spinal cord injury. Professor Weidner, it's all yours now. Yeah, thank you, Professor Unterberg, for this really kind uh, introduction. Also, thanks, Professor Unterberg and Dr. Junzi for the invitation and the opportunity to present uh, to this international uh, group of, of uh, neurosurgeons. And, and uh, yeah, I hope I can in, enrich your knowledge in a way. So I, I see myself as being second in line after patients have been admitted to your hospital and properly uh, treated in the very acute phase, then they, those patients are transferred to our facility. And um, yeah, this is where I'm gonna uh, start my presentation and hopefully you can see it. Yes, everything's good. Good, excellent. So let me just get this out of the way. Um, so um, overall, my presentation will not be, uh, has not the intention to give you a, a comprehensive overview about all um, 
uh, routinely applied rehab interventions, uh, including also a research strategy. So I would like to focus on, uh, let's say, innovative strategies in, in the field of uh, rehabilitation, as well as in the field of neuroregeneration, and, and mainly also in uh, fields and aspects we are also involved in and and it's not just uh, supposed to show you that uh, we can miraculously uh, cure spinal cord injury unfortunately this is not the case uh, but but we were dealing we are dealing with it and we were trying to to, to investigate in interventions and I, I would also like to expose you to to let's say the challenges that we face when 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 uh, trying out uh, new therapeutic interventions and I guess uh, what you see here on the on the left hand side is something you're all too familiar with. It's just uh, really just uh, simplified in this cartoon. You so you have a spinal cord injury either on the cervical or thoracic or lumbar level, uh, with a cord compression in the end uh, that that severs uh, all uh, or uh, some or more or all uh, descending motor pathways as well as ascending sensory pathways on top of that autonomic pathways that control uh, uh, the extremities that control inner organs and, and also exemplified one, one important uh, organ that, that is out of control is, is for example the bladder that can no longer be voluntarily voided and thus measures have to be taken to, 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 to circumvent uh, the problem. And uh, you've just heard from, from the previous uh, speaker very nicely how an acute uh, surgically, surgical intervention can look like in, in very specific uh, fracture aspects and, and how you fix it, how you decompress it. And of course, after that intensive care usually is, is, is the next step uh, to, to, to deal with all the uh, immediate complications um, of spinal cord injury. So, in our case, uh, so, so we are a comprehensive uh, spinal cord center. We provide a comprehensive spinal cord uh, spinal care, and 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 we are a rather interdisciplinary and and uh, multidisciplinary team uh, of uh, conservative uh, medical doctors, of uh, trauma surgeons, uh, so, so a really mixed bag, including um, very experienced nurses, very experienced physical therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, uh, and uh, you name it, and, and, and uh, social workers. And, and uh, so, so for us, the challenge is really to still cope with all the acute aspects of spinal cord injury and at the same time, as early as possible, integrate those patients into rehab interventions, which is sometimes a really small uh, path you, you, you uh, walk on and, and, and with the, uh, let's say, optimal end result to, to get the patient out of the hospital uh, as independent uh, as you can. And of course, that depends always on the injury severity as well as on uh, the, the level of injury. And um, as I said, one aspect, and it's, I guess, probably the most important aspect of all SEI patients is to, to, to be um, equipped with as much independence as possible when they leave the hospital. And uh, with rehabilitative interventions, we can do only so much. We cannot cure spinal cord injury, as you know, but of course, uh, we have developed, uh, let's say, compensatory strategies to, to, to find ways that uh, patients can get independence back. Of course, not completely uh, in all cases, but at least to, to some degree. And, and for this independence of utmost importance is, is proper arm and hand function. And then Christopher Reef, whom at least uh, the elder individuals in this audience may still know. So he's a, a famous American actor who fell from a horse and, and was uh, lifelong. Uh, he remained on the ventilator and, and was not able to, to move his upper and lower extremities. And, and what he said was obviously my new life means adjusting to the fact that I can never be alone means he is always 24 hours, seven days a week. He, he is dependent on, on, on uh, uh, caregivers. 
and and therefore it's only logical that if you ask especially chronic SEI patients, uh, cervical SEI patients in particular, what would be their priority if, if we would be able to give it back and that it would always be uh, or in most instances, arm and hand function. And one good example you see here on the right side, so that's a patient with a C5 uh, complete injury. And so he has a biceps function, but basically no hand function as you can see. So he's not able to transfer a cylinder or any other objects from, from A to B. And, and of course, that does not just refer to this abstract situation that also refers to daily activities like grabbing a fork or, or a, a pot of coffee or things like that and, and just uh, steer it to his mouth uh, to, to feed himself. And um, so question is, uh, do we find ways how, how to compensate that and, and, and to overcome that? So, so typically, and this is simplified here in this, this animation is, so you have a, an intention to, to, to move your upper extremities and the signal is sent down your spinal cord uh, towards the peripheral nervous system and in the end to the respective end muscle. And then this voluntary movement happens. And after spinal cord injury, obviously this, this signal is no longer transmitted uh, along the central cord. However, um, and that is, I would call it the engineer's perspective, um, the uh, the lower aspect, uh, meaning the, the lower motor neuron from the spinal cord to the through the peripheral nervous system to the muscle is still intact. And uh, what you can do is you can uh, apply electric, electrical impulses impulses to to to, to stimulate uh, those those uh, paretic muscles. And uh, if you do it in a rather coordinated fashion with other muscles, then you can uh, sort of uh, restore uh, a coordinated movement, which means also restoration, at least partial um, restoration of function. And how that happens, you see here, so there are different flavors this would come in. So uh, as shown on the left side, this would be like the, the non-invasive uh, variant. You apply a number of electrodes to, to extensor and flexor muscles in the, uh, in the, in the arm. Uh, that, that extend or, or flex the fingers and, and, and uh, in particular the thumb. And if you then stimulate these muscles in a, in a coordinated fashion, you can uh, restore different kind of uh, hand functions, uh, allowing to, to, to grab, for example, a bottle or, or a fork. And, and as I said, uh, steer it to the mouth. And that is all uh, then happens through through an electric stimulator who is able to, to coordinate that and and can can needs an interface of course of a muscle or muscle system that's still intact to 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 uh, to control this electrical stimulator which then again uh, controls the muscles in a coordinated fashion so this system is of course it's it's uh, rather easy to apply, does not require surgery, but it's not very selective, can be painful since this electrical stimulus in not sensory complete patients can be painful and uh, handling in some in, in times can be difficult. So of course, in the ideal world, it would be nice to, to, to integrate that uh, into the body. So implant the electrodes uh, directly on the muscle, uh, the rest pretty much re remains the same as you see on, on this right side cartoon. And in this case, for example, if the shoulder mus muscles are still intact and can be voluntarily uh, moved, uh, you can integrate a, a, a joystick there. And, and uh, with this shoulder movement, you, you control the, the joystick, which then again controls the electrical stimulator, which uh, controls uh, the respective muscles and you can induce proper um, hand function. Of course, this uh, advantage is it has a better long-term stability. It's easy to use, but it's invasive and it's, it's I guess, only use, suited for, for, for chronic SEI patients. And how it really works, you can see in, in this uh, concrete uh, example. So this is a patient that you saw before and after implantation of this uh, um, electrodes, and, and the stimulator, you can see that the patient is able to, to grasp objects, to move them from A to B. And um, he controls opening and closure of the hand with the movement of his left shoulder. shoulder. So if you look closely to the left shoulder, you see this 
uh, uh, movement that he performs when he uh, switches from closing to opening of the hand. And that does not only work in these abstract situations, it really works in real life situations. And this patient uh, worked with the system for uh, almost 10 years. However, then he got an infection of this uh, 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 electrodes uh, along his muscles and the company unfortunately went bankrupt. There is no new company who produces this kind of electrodes or this kind of system. And therefore it had to be explanted without re-implantation, which was actually pretty sad because that really uh, raise the level of independence in this uh, patient. Of course, there are other means uh, if, if, for example, shoulder function is no longer present to sort of steer such a system. And uh, one system would be uh, facilitated uh, through a brain computer phase. You may have, I'm sure you have heard of uh, brain computer interfaces, basically what what is done, you, you find uh, specific patterns, for example, a movement intention, and that can be detected uh, with uh, specific algorithms and uh, can then be um, fed into uh, a, an effector system, as you have seen, uh, which would allow you to also uh, control uh, at least a part of the movements uh, of, of, of arm and hand. And uh, that this works in principle, um, I can show you um, in the next uh, slide what you also need to be aware of. This is a non-invasive system. So all we work with here in Heidelberg are uh, non-invasive systems. Of course, there are invasive systems which have advantages uh, and disadvantages, just like also the electrodes or, or on muscles. Um, um, but uh, our system we are working with is a non-invasive system um, that uh, patients can put on if they need it or, or leave off if, if, if they don't need it. Of course, um, handling is, is an issue uh, that, that, that um, needs to be solved. And um, let me just get rid of the tone here. So, so what you see here is a patient um, as opposed to the patient you saw before, he has no uh, elbow flexion function left and therefore he would not be able to, 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 to put an object towards his mouth if, if he would not have an additional support. And uh, this additional support is applied in, in, in uh, in the way of a, a motor orthosis that allows uh, technically uh, facilitated uh, elbow flexion, but on top of that, he also needs uh, to, to be equipped with uh, hand flexion and hand extension. And this hand extension and hand flexion is, is, is uh, uh, made possible through this uh, electrode placed on respective muscles. And uh, as you've seen in the patient before, however, the patient needs to be able then to switch somehow uh, to this motor driven orthosis to flex his uh, elbow. And this switch from one kind of movement of the hand flex and extension to uh, the, the elbow that is then, uh, uh, let's say, made possible through this brain computer interface, which um, through movement intention allows the patient to switch um, to um, his motor orthosis and, and allow elbow flexion. And this is what you then see in the uh, lower left, uh, lower right video. So here he switched to this motor driven orthosis and only that allows him in the end to lead this ice cube uh, or this, this ice cone uh, towards his mouth. So in principles, you see that things like that work. However, they require a lot of setup, which of course in daily life is not something that is really feasible uh, as of now. But, but as you know, uh, technology develops further and, and maybe in a couple of years that could be a system that, that at least uh, could work in, in, in very severely affected uh, cervical spinal cord injured patients. So another aspect that relates to rehabilitation is of course, um, how do we deal with patients with incomplete spinal cord injury? So those are patients that have uh, remaining uh, um, motor function and, and 
there we might have the chance to, to restore function. And, and as you see, so these are some data from, from a database in Hamburg that collects data from all SEI patients. As you see over time, uh, from 2005 to 2015, the number of incomplete SEI patient, uh, patients increases. And therefore, this is a, a relevant aspect of, of uh, spinal cord rehabilitation. And one uh, uh, treatment modality uh, you, you, you may know is, is, is uh, for example, butt deep weight supported treadmill training as shown here. This is a, a machine, of course, this is one machine. There are other machines that you can use. They're uh, equipped also with exoskeletons to, to, to support the, the paratic muscles. Um, but this is a machine, rather big machine that can only be usually uh, um, started or, or run in a, in, a, in a rehab facility. This is not something uh, that can be used uh, at home by the patient. But considering that the time for the patient in the hospital or in a rehab facility gets shorter and shorter. Rüdiger Rupp uh, here in the clinic, electric engineer developed a system that sort of mimics this uh, body weight supported treadmill, but allows the patient to use that kind of device completely by himself without any uh, caregiver assistance to transfer into this device. He called it Morgate and uh, it, 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 it uh, really, um, uh, tries to mimic many aspects of body weight supported treadmill training, as you can see here in this video on the right side. It even has a uh, some kind of sensory stimulation on the on the foot sole that also mimics the the the, the, the movement while you walk about a surface, which are known to be important stimuli for for walking uh, movement, and. Um, he did a pilot study for that in chronic SEI patients. And as you see, so this is a 10 meter walk test down here. And as you can see those patients, chronic SEI patients, so they should have already a stable condition of their spinal cord injury. They definitely improved in their, in their uh, walking uh, per performance and, and nine out of 25 participants required uh, fewer walking aids. And as you can see here, they, they uh, definitely improved in terms of their walking function. Of course, that needs to be maintained over time. This is not a one-time treatment, so this needs to be continued in order to really uh, maintain the functional status. Yeah, so this was a brief excursion uh, into to, to, to rehab uh, interventions that, that we are interested in, in, in dealing with. I think another dimension is, is, is uh, to, to translate uh, preclinical aspects of, of uh, regenerative treatments um, into the clinic. And this uh, is what I would like to tell you in the second part uh, of my presentation. Uh, as you've seen in the previous slide, it, it is really a, a very, very long journey. And of course, that also relates to the fact that spinal cord injury is a rare disease. So we do not have that many patients. And as you know, for a clinical trial, you need as many patients as possible in order to tease out a, a, a treatment effect. And uh, one study we are, uh, uh, let's say, key partner uh, in, in, in the clinical trial. However, we have not developed the preclinical strategies. So this is work um, primarily from Martin Schwab from Zurich. You, I'm sure you've heard of it. So he developed the so-called anti-NOGO antibody treatment for spinal cord injury. The way it works is that um, he uh, developed an antibody uh, that is able to, to, to uh, neutralize certain proteins. Uh, they, they are called no-go, so the axon is not able to go anywhere after spinal cord injury because this myelin-based inhibitors get expressed. And if you apply an antibody, those uh, proteins are neutralized and at least to some degree, uh, uh, severed axons are able to, to regrow for a certain distance. However, prerequisite is that this will work only, and this is known from preclinical studies in incomplete spinal cord injury. So, and um, this is just one out of many, many uh, preclinical uh, studies from Martin Schwab's group. So this is work in, in monkeys where they severed the corticospinal tract. Uh, that you see here uh, um, shown in this camera lucida drawing on, in the left panel in, in black uh, is transected and you see below the injury very few spared uh, fibers. However, if you apply the anti novo antibody, there are many more fibers that go beyond the injury site, uh, suggesting that they are the neuroanatomical substrate that uh, can help to recover at least uh, partial uh, function. 
and that has actually been shown in, in these monkey studies, but also in rat and, and mice studies as well. And uh, we did the first phase one study, also multi-center study uh, from 2006 uh, to 2010. Uh, where we uh, first in man uh, applied this antibody. It has to be applied intrathecally and it has to be applied uh, several times. And, and uh, those are really just a few glimpses out of this uh, work. Uh, we can show that, that we have uh, proper concentrations in the CFS, CSF as well as in the serum. We know that the administration route is safe and we didn't observe any uh, adverse events or severe adverse events that uh, kept us from, from continuing with a, a phase two study. And um, unfortunately, the phase one was sponsored through Novartis and, and they no longer were interested in this kind of uh, uh, therapies. And therefore we, we had to find a, a different, let's say source of funding or way to, to conduct a phase two clinical trial. And, and we applied for a grant by the, at the EU and, and got funding to, to, to run a multi-center phase two, phase two study, a randomized uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trial where we want to learn more about the efficacy of this treatment uh, with this anti nogo A antibody versus placebo and by repeated intrathecal injection in uh, originally planned 132 cervical SEI patients uh, with a, a completeness uh, of uh, A all the way up to incompleteness of AIS-C. And our primary endpoint in this trial is to, to, to look for the recovery of, of neurological function, in particular the upper extremity motor score. And of course, we are also interested in other aspects, uh, not just the upper extremity, but also lower extremity sensory and motor function, as well as functional aspects of grasping, of walking and uh, autonomic function. Of course, we also look for adverse events, uh, vital signs, pain and spasticity. So this is how the intervention looks like. Patients have to be included within the first 28 days after injury. They receive repeated injection of uh, um, the anti antibody um, six times uh, with, a, with an interval of five days in between. And then uh, the patients uh, are followed up for, for a total of half a year and an additional half year they are followed up outside of the clinical trial within our um, international um, MSCI network. And these are just trying to, uh, some examples that try to highlight some of the, uh, let's say, hurdles we had to or that we faced. Um, so number one, this antibody formulation was not ready when the when the uh, the project funding started in 2016, and and uh, so it took us two years to really get the antibody ready to to, to be applied. And of course, this time uh, was lost to to include patients. Uh, and we started off with uh, seven uh, centers Europe wide in Germany, Switzerland, and and Italy, Czech Republic, and Barcelona. And uh, then we had to come up with mitigation strategies. So we uh, added other centers in Switzerland and, and Germany, which you see in the lower panel to, to sort of uh, raise our uh, uh, enrollment efficiency. And, and uh, we were able to luckily in the end start this clinical trial in 2019, mainly with Swiss and German sites. However, uh, as part of the EU trial, we of course had to uh, activate the, the sites in Italy and uh, Spain and uh, the Czech Republic, uh, but I'm not going to dive into the regulatory aspects related to, the, to, to such an international study, but I, to say the least, it's, it's challenging uh, to, to, to run a study in, in, in countries that are not speaking one language and have not one system uh, in terms of uh, regulatories. And um, one point I would like to also uh, um, highlight is that all of this work is only was only possible because we had a preset uh, international uh, EU wide network so called EMSKI, where we were already uh, experienced and skilled to do all the as assessments necessary uh, since uh, 2001 so we were pretty much ready to go for, uh, to, to run this clinical trial I think without that it would not have been possible. And this is just to show you a number of assessments. You don't need to learn them or to, 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 to understand them in detail within this MSKIN network and also within the clinical trial. We do a number of neurological as well as functional as well as electrophysiological assessments in a standardized fashion at 
defined time points. And we collect many data, now more than 5,000 data sets uh, across Europe from these patients to monitor and, and describe their natural recovery. So you, you see the, the number of core sets, this is up to 2018. So now we have, as I said, more than 5,000. Why do I mention that um, this plays a role now? Because we had to adopt also the, the clinical trial design. We, we looked into these data from back from 2001 until now, and we found those data, except for a few aspects, for example, like, like age of, of average age of SEI patients, um, that changed over the years, but the, the, the neurological and then also the functional recovery in these patients remained extremely stable over these years. I mentioned that because then we had the idea to also uh, include more uh, uh, controls, um, well, you could call it historical controls in order to save uh, uh, real controls, which would allow us to, 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 to reduce the number of patients to enroll in the end, to be enrolled in the end. And, and of course, that saves us time to, to still successfully finish the study in time. And, and uh, this is what we came up with after uh, intense discussions with our statisticians, uh, we came up we came down with a number uh, originally estimated of uh, 134 to 104, and, and we will have now a reduced number of, of uh, controls that receive placebo, and we add uh, external controls, meaning patients, match patients from the EMSCI database in order to really uh, have a proper um, control group. And uh, on the right side, so this is a real a recent uh, standing of, of our clinical trial, so we have now uh, uh, randomized and uh, started dosing in, in, in 60 uh, patients. Uh, dosing completed is in 53 uh, patients and uh, the study is finished by 38 patients. And, and we are um, quite confident that we're going to uh, be able to complete this clinical trial by the end of next year. And uh, unfortunately, due to that fact, we, I do not have any results I can present to you in terms of efficacy. What I can tell you is that in terms of safety, uh, we have all the adverse and severe adverse events are within the range that we would expect related to spinal cord injury, but not to the administration route and, and not to the drug. And that was also... Uh, recently uh, confirmed by the uh, by the safety uh, board that of course uh, supports us and 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 helps us to judge uh, about all these aspects. Yeah, and uh, at this point I'm at the end. So hopefully, maybe at the next meeting, uh, if I have the chance to present to you, uh, I can show you first results. But uh, I think that is just about to to show you things are moving forward, but of course not as fast as everybody would expect. And um, I thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Weidner. This was really um, an excellent overview. First of all, on um, well, um, the actual statement for rehab, and this was really um, fascinating. And also the NOGO trial and the register trial, um, very important issues. Um, my burning question after your talk, is there a role for neurosurgery for example, in implantation of neuroprosthetics after spinal cord injury? Or will that be a role for whoever? <laughs> I, I would uh, think so. I, I think um, this is a field that is still uh, pretty new. And, and uh, for example, I mean, I explained to you, uh, addressed only aspects that are well, under development and not yet established. So, for example, uh, one one aspect that's that's almost uh, established as a clinical care uh, treatment is is narrow of transfer surgery or muscle tendon transfers in order to 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 improve upper extremity function. And I would think, since since neurosurgeons are experts in in peripheral nerve surgery as well, that that is definitely an aspect that that uh, where contribution by neuro surgeons could be extremely uh, helpful as well as interventions that that uh, um, uh, relate to uh, electrode implantation but that of course depends on whether such a system really would be available uh, in, a, in a commercial fashion to, to use which mm -hmm. is not yet there and 
just referring to neuroprosthetics in the upper extremities. But of course, I guess we will hear, hear from Dr. Yunzi about spinal cord stimulation that there will be a, uh, other uh, areas uh, of interest for neurosurgeons uh, where that would be extremely important to have this, of course, uh, uh, support. Okay, yeah, thank you. There are questions in the um, Q&A section concerning stem cells and we will postpone them because I know that Dr. Yunzi will talk about this. Um, but um, to Professor Weidner, um, do you have any experience in transposition of the C5, C6 nerves? Can you comment on this? Is this maybe surgically a valid option? Um, so, so, so you mean transposition at the nerve root level or? or, or, or? Yeah, or, or, or exactly. on the peripheral nerve level. Peripheral nerve level. Yeah, no, no, we do not have experience yet, but we would like to really dig into that field because uh, there is a recent study uh, that came out from, from an Australian group. I mean, that has been done over quite a few years now, but they did a really good job in doing it in a real standardized way and that they presented re extremely good data. And therefore, if we would have good uh, clinical uh, partners uh, from neurosurgery, for example, to, to help us in, in accomplishing this kind of intervention that would be uh, extremely welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there are some more questions, but uh, unfortunately I have to move on yeah. because otherwise we will be um, have a close down. Thank you. A lockdown. Uh, and uh, Dr. Yunzi shall also uh, have an opportunity to present his ideas about the so far experimental treatment um, modalities, opportunities of uh, spinal cord injury. And of course, he will talk also about um, stem cells. Again, Norbert, many thanks for your contribution and we will stay in contact. My pleasure. Mm, finally, Last speaker, um, last presenter will be Dr. Alexander Yunzi. Um, he's also a very young neurosurgeon in our department here in Heidelberg. And uh, he, uh, both clinically and experimentally, he's focusing on um, severe brain trauma and spinal cord injury. And now his presentation will be about um, potential um, well, let's say future developments, how to attack spinal cord injury in terms of regeneration and uh, well, recovery. And um, the stage is for you now. Thank you, Professor Lebeck, for the kind introduction. Um, I also uh, will start my presentation now. I hope it should be online. Um, yes. Yeah, perfect. So I will directly jump to the pathophysiology of spinal cord injury because I think we've heard a lot um, on uh, epidemiology and also uh, the surgical and medical treatment, but um, what is causing those uh, severe um, deficits and what is uh, making this disease so complex and disastrous, although we've heard that uh, not so many patients are suffering from it. So um, we've, seen we've, uh, we've seen images like this a uh, very devastating injury to the spinal cord. And this is a primary injury happening in accidents and so forth. And it's not an injury that we can uh, prevent, but um, the problem is that um, with this primary injury, a, um, let's say secondary injury uh, is uh, initiated. And uh, this is mainly due to compression of the spinal cord, due to edema in the spinal cord, contusion in the spinal cord, and also ischemia. And as uh, Dr. Ishak, um, uh, mentioned and he's shown a lot of really nice cases, uh, mechanical instability is adding to uh, those uh, effects. And the secondary injury uh, is what we try to treat as neurosurgeons, as uh, neurologists, and our treatments basically mainly focus on the neural protection. So as you treatment, we elevate the blood pressure, um, we um, perform surgical decompression as we have learned, and we can uh, in, in some cases uh, offer corticosteroids. But uh, the problem is this, that this secondary injury is just the tip of the iceberg and it's ongoing uh, until chronic stages. Um, it's basically ongoing until weeks and months after the primary injury. And it leads to a lot of 
um, very distinct uh, processes in the angel spinal cord. And um, some of them are shown here. So um, we see acidogliosis in scar formation. So the extracellular matrix is forming a scar. The astrocytes form a scar. We see uh, a cystic cavity forming in the uh, injured spinal cord. We see ongoing inflammation and edema. And of course, uh, from the first second until weeks after, we see uh, separation of axons. We see demulation of axons. So this injury actually goes on and it makes it so difficult to, to treat. It's really heterogeneous. And it, um, yeah, it makes this, uh, this event so disastrous and patients have lifelong deficits. There's no cure, as Professor Weidner said, loss of independence. And um, we didn't talk about this yet, we won't, but uh, the socioeconomic costs, although it's not so many patients, are uh, very high. And when patients are asked what, uh, what they want to improve for themselves, Professor Weidner also showed this in his presentation. Uh, basically, they are asking for neurogeneration. So they want to have, um, restoration of motor ball that of in sexual function and um, paraplegic patients, of course, want to regain mobility and then tetraplegic patients, they are really happy if only they could use arm and hand function because um, that would make them less independent. And um, regeneration um, is a big problem. And um, well, what does it mean? It means replacement and repair of the neural structures that are, um, that are um, yeah, make, making all these functions possible. Uh, and those are typically neurons, glial cells, axons, synapses, myelin, myelin sheets, and all the other cells and structures in the spinal cord. And the problem is that uh, this neuroregeneration already um, under normal conditions in, in a healthy spinal cord uh, are really, uh, really, really, really limited. Um, there is, nobody knows why, but there's limited cellular plasticity and also presence of growth inhibitors. Uh, Nogo was mentioned already. And uh, when you now add the injury, there are uh, severe physical and chemical barriers that uh, make uh, neurodegeneration basically nearly impossible. There's this, uh, this astrocytic scar, there are uh, fibroblasts that are uh, replacing the extracellular matrix with uh, fibrous connective tissue. So um, the environment is really bad for regeneration. And what, what this means is that the only way to, for patients to regain some function is to uh, support and to improve the regeneration, your regeneration that is not happening on itself. And the only way so far is, and we've learned about this now uh, in, in depth um, in the last presentation of Professor Weidner is uh, rehabilitation. And we know, and we do this, that we should start with it as soon as possible. And there are several really nice and sophisticated ways of doing this. But as Professor Weidner said, it's no cure and um, the effects are still very limited. And um, and luckily, there uh, has been and is still um, a lot of research going on in this field. And it's really astonishing to me because, um, again, it's, it's a fairly small um, group of patients, but there's a lot of research um, and there are a lot of preclinical experiments and studies and people are really interested in treating this disease. This is just a, uh, a PubMed hit for spinal cord injury neuroregeneration. And you can also see that interest is really um, uh, rising and um, in my talk, because there is so much to talk about, but I want to focus on a couple of, uh, of fields that I think are uh, interesting and also um, and that have been um, in part at least um, translated into clinical studies. And some of those fields are really emerging and um, are, yeah, I would say really interesting, um, but uh, I hope you would agree at the end. So um, first of all, I want to talk about drugs. And, um, Professor Weidner already uh, presented the NISKI trial, and I think this is uh, an astonishing trial, and uh, everybody's looking forward to seeing these results. Um, I will skip this, but um, there's another drug I want to introduce, one that has been talked about a lot uh, in the recent years. Um, it is based on uh, the problem of the row walk pathway in the, in the injured spinal cord. So this pathway is, has been associated with uh, impaired regeneration. Uh, it uh, increases upper process of uh, neurons of glial cells and it leads to activation of uh, proteoglycans in the extracellular matrix. So it's a bad pathway, basically. I mean, it's a little broad, but I think you can sum it up like this. And um, uh, luckily there is a, uh, a way of uh, antagonizing this pathway and there's an antagonist for the raw protein, uh, citrin. And uh, there have been a lot of promising preclinical findings on this drug and there have been animal models uh, that have shown that uh, long distance regeneration of neurons is possible functional recovery is possible. So 
this drug has already been uh, already been translated into the clinical practice practice but clinical trials and there's been a phase one and two trial uh, with uh, 48 patients uh, um, it has been published in 2011 so this is quite old um, and it, it just showed that cetrine was very, very well tolerated but also that uh, a third of the patients um, showed improvement which was really astonishing from asia a so complete injury to asia c uh, to d and those positive uh, results uh, as usual have been used and uh, uh, phase 2b3 trial has been performed this is just um, the publication in 2000 and 18 that um, um, provided information on the study design and the way um, this uh, has been administered was uh, during surgery in 70 patients with acute cervical SCI and also a very severe injury is Asia grade A and B. Uh, during surgery, we learned about surgery, so those patients received surgery. Um, the drug was ad mixed with fibrin sealant and was added on a dura mater. It's really interesting, so it had to diffuse through the dura. And um, this uh, study assessed uh, the upper extremity motor score after six months. So the focus, uh, as usual, cervical spinal cord injury is a um, function of the upper extremity. And um, this study has been terminated in uh, 2018. And so far, this is quite sad. No um, results have been scientifically published. But if you look at the clinicaltrials.gov website, they are uh, have been forced to, to publish results there, obviously. And um, if you look at it, you see that there is obviously no significant effect of the drug uh, in this um, in this trial. So um, probably there will be I don't know if, will, if there will be any publication, but it seems like the trial has failed, and we're still waiting for some results. But um, this would be maybe a sad end of this uh, pathway and this drug. But there are other drug trials on the way. Uh, we have also heard from Professor Weidner that it's really difficult to perform um, phase three or clinical trials uh, in spinal cord injury because um, not so many patients. But interestingly, in Taiwan, and also I'll skip to this directly, in Japan, there are still two drug trials. I mean, overall, there's maybe a handful. Um, one is using recombinant human acidic fibroblast growth factor, and the other one is using hepatocyte growth factor, so two growth factor studies. Uh, used as uh, drugs uh, by uh, pharma companies. And one uh, aims to, it's, it's an RCT, a multi-centered randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. So um, a nice study protocol, and it aims to include 160 patients. So a huge effort. And it just started, uh, it just started in 2017. And maybe there will be some results soon. We don't know. Uh, the other study has only 25 uh, patients, and it just started. So uh, we, we are, yeah. We'll see, and there I think is some hope for to those two uh, growth factors to uh, show some effects. Now let's um, switch to stem cells. Stem cells uh, have already been uh, discussed in the group chat here, and they are kind of omnipresent, uh, and also um, not only in spinal cord injury in many diseases, but also in spinal cord injury. And they have been following. We have been following stem, stem cells, uh, uh, the research. Uh, efforts that have been made have been going on for, I would say, two or three decades already. So they are supposed to provide trophic factors. They are supposed to modulate the inflammatory response, regenerate lost neural circuits, and also remediate denuded axons. And then some of them are also supposed to integrate uh, into the injured spinal cord and really differentiate into cells, and replenish cells. Um, there's a lot of different stem cell types used um, for transplantation uh, after spinal cord injury. And I um, will try to focus on the mesenchymal stem cells, the neural stem cells, because I think that researchers have uh, most experience with those cells and uh, they have been used for the longest time. And the others are, uh, I would say, rather emerging. But um, yeah, um, let's start with the mesenchymal stem cells. So mesenchymal stem cells have been uh, used for, for transplantation, transplantation strategies for um, yeah, over a decade has been the results have been published in 2012 already, and the group by uh, Cretanmont et al. have shown nicely that the mesenchymal stem cells after transplantation in animal models of spinal cord injury lead to more angiogenesis and also improved motor function. And there have been a lot of um, similar preclinical findings and studies, a lot of really promising results. And mesenchymal stem cells have already been translated into the clinical practice. There was a phase three trial already. Um, published in 2016 in Korea as well. 
uh, and this uh, study included 16 patients. So it's a rather small study, and um, uh, the cells were transplanted uh, in the chronic phase after spinal cord injury. So already 12 months after the trauma. And uh, unfortunately, only two out of these 16 patients showed any improvement. So uh, this study, I mean, they, they nicely showed that the transportation in humans is possible, no side effects, I mean, in the short term, but no real benefit as well. So it's rather a negative trial. Um, that's why um, newer studies and also our lab in Heidelberg has focused on NPCs, neural precursor cells, because um, in contrast to mesenchymal stem cells, they um, have the at least the capability of uh, different differentiating into uh, neurons, glial cells after transmutation. They really are supposed to also replenish the, the cells that have been lost. And uh, we have worked with those cells for a couple of years. And we've, for example, shown that they also, when they are transplanted, uh, for example, in the subacute phase after injury in animal models, um, attenuate, so improve the um, inflammatory reaction. So they have other positive effects on secondary injury processes as well, uh, shown here with macrophages, and they also reduce apoptosis. And there have been a lot of similar studies. And I want to uh, point out one really impressive study by Lou et al. published in Cell in 2012 already. So this uh, has been uh, really well recognized because the authors have um, shown that when they transplanted neural precursor cells in a transaction model where the spinal cord is really uh, cut, uh, they can still uh, observe uh, outgrowth of axons of these spinal, of these NPCs, of these uh, stem cells over the lesion. And they have also shown nice integration of the cells. And they have also shown really nice um, um, functional recovery of these injured rats. And positive findings like uh, this study have led to a couple of clinical trials on the transportation of uh, st neural stem cells. One has been published uh, in the Journal of Neurotrauma in 2018. This has been a multi-center study, phase two, proof of, co proof of concept uh, in 12 patients. And um, the study has been uh, terminated, unfortunately, because uh, although no negative effects have been found, no positive effects have been found as well. So um, this is one of the um, NPC studies that is also, I would say, um, a failure or um, no positive um, effects. And this is this is a little bit a problem of stem cells. There have been a couple of nice reviews um, recently. This one has been published last year. And the authors have tried to summarize all the completed uh, stem cell trials uh, in uh, spinal cord injury treatment so far. 18 uh, such trials have been identified and um, 14 of them with the older MSCs and four with them or with, uh, I would say, newer NPCs. Some of the studies are really impressive. Phase three, some of them are 300 patients. But um, the problem is that, um, first of all, those studies are really heterogeneous. The, the methods, the outcome measurements, everything is different. And um, it's really difficult to compare the results. And uh, the other problem is that a lot of those uh, trials have never been published. So this is a little shady and it makes you think what is happening there. And uh, for the ones that have been published, at least no severe side effects and mostly promising results, but nothing that really um, has been really astonishing. And um, currently there are 12 uh, more clinical trials, uh, even phase three trials ongoing. And I mean, some uh, good results might be expected, but a problem of stem cells is that uh, they are fairly complex to administer, to prepare. The logistics are complex. They typically re require immunosuppression. And even in the uh, preclinical studies, the survival of those cells in the injured spinal cord, especially in the acute phase, is really low. So personally, I see um, a lot of problems with this, uh, here put, uh, with this treatment per se. But you never know. We'll hopefully uh, see um, better results in the future. Meanwhile, stem cells, um, and stem cell therapy can also be used differently. Uh, we have looked at, at the secretome and others have uh, looked at the secretome. So extracellular vesicles that are secreted by stem cells uh, in depth. And this has mostly been done with uh, mesenchymal stem cells. 
And those uh, extracellular vesicles, uh, exosomes, for example, they are a hot topic anyway, because they have become the focus of clinical applications uh, as biomarkers, also as treatment options in other diseases. And also um, in spinal cord injury, there have been reports, mostly um, on mesenchymal uh, um, stem cells, that when you um, use their exosomes, you can isolate them um, and you can also quantify them and you can characterize them and you can look at their cargo and they have really impressive cargo. So they have growth factors inside and they have uh, microRNAs and, and such. So um, authors have used those exosomes and they have uh, used them as an alternative to cell-based treatment and have just administered the exosomes uh, systemically in an animal model of spinal cord injury. And um, by this, they have shown that um, a lot of secondary injury processes are uh, improved, for example, in neuroinflammation and also functional recovery is, is improved. And the theory is that um, what stem cells do, the positive effects they, uh, they bring, they, um, they um, also use their exosomes. And if you just use the exosomes, you still have a couple of the positive benefits from stem cells, but you don't have all the downside effects and all the negative effects and all the problems. And we have um, started to look at the exosome of, of NPCs, of neural pre uh, precursor cells. We think NPCs are the better alternative in general for stem cell uh, therapy. This is a paper published recently where for the first time uh, such exosomes from NPC have been characterized and authors found that they um, contain a lot of uh, specific microRNA and they promote neogenesis. And we have um, now um, successful, successfully isolated um, exosomes from NPCs and we have extensively characterized those exosomes. And we have learned a lot of, about their cargo and they also contain a lot of growth factors and signaling peptides. And right now we are trying to use those exosomes and um, you know, treat cells in vitro and also treat animals um, in an animal model of spinal cord injury. So there might be a chance of stem cells 2.0 to um, have a brighter future. Another way of improving stem cell therapy, and this leads me to the field of genetic therapy, is to um, modify or uh, to induce the stem cells to more functional cells. So this group, um, Ali et al., uh, this is really, really recent research has um, uh, used new technologies to um, uh, create stem cells out of fibroblasts and then to induce those uh, uh, stem cells further into functional motor neurons. And then they have transplanted the motor neurons, not the stem cells. And they have really impressively uh, improved the motor function in uh, spinal cord injury mice, or in this case, rats. And um, the, the whole background here is that uh, with newer technologies, and I want to introduce the field of gene therapy with uh, two publications that have been uh, really uh, shaken, the, uh, I think, the research world uh, in the last year. Um, the newer te technologies like the CRISPR-Cas um, method have allowed researchers to um, genetically modify somatic cells by using, for example, viral vectors in this group from SU. Um, they have uh, used um, an, an adenovirus, custom designed, and the adenovirus uh, led to um, selective knockdown of a gene of an RNA binding protein, PTPP1. And by uh, this knockdown in selective cells, in uh, glial cells in the eye, um, the glial cells have been um, converted to functional neurons. And in a glaucoma model of, uh, of animals, uh, of mice, uh, they, the authors showed that mice can see again, which is really impressive. And the same technology, similar technology, and the same target gene, PTPP1, has been used by another group, and this has been pu published in Nature. And they have used a different adenovirus as a vector to introduce the genetic information into specific cells. They have targeted astrocytes in a Parkinson model, also in animals, so animals that had Parkinson, and they converted astrocytes to uh, functioning neurons as well. And then they basically, I don't know, cured or improved uh, uh, this neurological disorder. And um, those were really impressive results and um, research, researchers have begun um, to think about um, cellular reprogramming as a new treatment uh, paradigm for various diseases. And also um, in spinal cord injury, this is a um, 
evolving concept because silencing or expression of genes of interest uh, via uh, custom designed viral vectors um, in uh, astrocytes and other glial cells uh, is possible. It's doable and it's not that complicated. And um, the new possibilities are in spinal cord injury and we are um, actually uh, working on this right now. We are um, creating viruses, adenoviruses and lentiviruses custom made that only infect astrocytes. And um, uh, we hope that we can um, convert astrocytes in vivo in situ to either neurons or even neuronal precursor cells and to uh, thus treat a glial skull and also boost available stem cells. So this is um, an evolving field. There's no clinical data on this yet, but gene therapy should be kept in mind, maybe can be translated to humans as well. Now, last but not least, biomaterials. This has been an important topic as well. And um, they, um, there have been a lot of natural materials and also synthetic materials that have been used um, to basically create scaffolds um, in the injured spinal cord. So this is an example for a plant-based um, nanotube material that has been used. This is an example for a 3D printed silicon uh, based um, uh, scaffold. And those scaffolds are typically uh, injected or transplanted into the injured spinal cord in chronic injury stages, because then there is often a cystic cavity or a scar, and they are supposed to bridge the damaged tissue, and they are supposed to promote endogenous external regrowth and to improve the environment so that um, tissue growth and general vascularization is facilitated. And also, and this brings me to the really important topic of combination, they are the perfect base for, um, for example, uh, drug delivery or for gene delivery and so forth. So they can be equipped or loaded with, um, with even with stem cells, with the drugs, and they then uh, continuously pour out these uh, substances into the spinal cord. And um, they are part of a lot of um, synergistic treatment strategies. And I think what uh, I wanted to, sh to show you and what I hope you have seen now is that there are um, several um, individual treatment strategies in the experimental setting and um, they all have uh, most of them have nice preclinical findings some of them have been translated in, into the uh, into clinical studies but um, with um, yeah, complex or um, not so uh, convincing results and a problem is that this disease as i mentioned in the introduction is really heterogeneous there are so many different processes and um, researchers uh, and us as well in our lab we I have understood that we should focus on uh, combining different individual approaches and find something uh, that is uh, synergistic and the way it works. And this has been done, for example, by Professor Zegberger, the leader of our lab. He has combined self assembling peptides. So this is another uh, biomaterial. It's liquid. You can inject it into the spinal cord. He has used this uh, con clip contusion compression spinal cord injury in rats and injected this, uh, these peptides and he has added um, neural stem cell transplantation. And in combination, he has shown that the stem cells survive nicely and that um, a lot of secondary injury changes are improved. We have in our lab um, uh, also improved stem cell transplantation by additionally um, administering growth factors. And we have also, in addition, um, added treadmill training, which was really interesting. So by combining these three individual treatments, um, we have drastically improved um, survival and differentiation of the stem cells, but also the functional recovery of the injured rats. And um, another thing that uh, has been done, we have uh, worked with uh, this um, master regulator growth factor, Sonic Hedgehog as well. Um, we have combined Sonic Hedgehog um, with stem cells. This is really recent data. And if you um, combine such treatments, uh, in this case as well, you can uh, in, in improve functional recovery in combination and you can also improve the individual treatment so stem cells uh, they, they drastically improve improve their survival and differentiation if they are um, combined with for example sonic hedgehog or treatment training or other individual treatments and now think about combining adding drugs to this or adding uh, gene therapy to this so if you have uh, a basket of treatments uh, maybe even customized to the patient there might be a chance and this brings me to the last slide that this uh, disastrous disease or event can actually be uh, better treated or cured. So it's complex. Uh, it has a lot of uh, different injury processes, um, not so simple. 
endogenous regeneration is basically non-existent. Uh, rehabilitation, that's the only thing we can currently do. Experimental treatments um, are heavily started, luckily, but there is no golden bullet, yet no single uh, treatment that has cured uh, and made people walk. And I personally think, and so do um, um, other researchers, that um, the way of, 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 of treating this disease or maybe even to cure this disease is to, first of all, combine different um, promising um, therapeutic approaches. And also when we translate our findings into clinical trials to um, standardize trial designs, to modify trial designs, to maybe identify subpopulations of spinal cord injury patients that uh, benefit more. And I think um, now that uh, a couple of those trials are done by pharmaceutical companies, there will be some change in the design of those trials as, as well. So uh, uh, this is the end of my talk. Thank you. And I'm looking forward uh, to your questions, obviously. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Yunzi. Um, you really reviewed the um, huge topic um, very efficiently. And uh, there are numerous ways how to get to a better regeneration. And um, well, if I may start with a comment of mine, you um, really um, nicely showed us that a lot of studies are going on. And to answer some of the questions in the Q&A section, a mere stem cell injection in um, spinal cord injury patients is of no good use. It's a no-go and should not be done. And uh, it is like scarletonism. Some people, and there are also some uh, neurosurgeons who are injecting stem cells in order to, um, to foster and to improve regeneration, but uh, it's of no use, number one. And number two, all these studies are experimental so far. Now, my question to you, you said there is no golden bullet, but um, one or two really approaches guiding into the future. If you would have to spend money, where would you like to spend it to get some regain, some repay? It would require a lot of money. <laughs> but I, I really think that this field of uh, genetic, uh, I mean, it's probably not the, the right terminology, but let's call it a genetic therapy um, is really promising because why, why not use what is already there and just change the phenotype of cells and reprogram them, them so that they uh, do no harm, but do something beneficial. And um, this can be, right with the technologies we have, this can be turned on and off. This can be custom tailored to specific cell populations so the safety should hopefully be not the biggest issue anymore in the future. And um, uh, this, can be, uh, this can be performed um, hopefully fairly easily compared to stem cell transportation and such. So, um, and then the other thing is, as I said, I really also think that similar to traumatic brain injury, uh, com combination is, is key. So I put my money on genetic therapy Plus, it's not part of the question, but still combining other stuff with it. So there okay, would be my answer. Thank you. There are two questions uh, from the section. Um, what about the Yale study with autologous stem cells? And another one, um, you are probably aware of the INSPIRE study in which US neurosurgical centers used PLGA graft in acute spinal cord injury to bridge the lesion comment okay, so the, 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 the first question so I'm not I, I do not know the um, the, the Yale study uh, but uh, um, the the, the uh, idea behind it is is um, I'm, I think I'm f familiar with so um, this is even more complicated to uh, to obtain or to perform but of course um, if you have an injured patient and you have um, uh, you perform surgery and you obtain some tissue, um, even uh, in the spine, in the, uh, the spinal cord is still an endogenous stem cell population. If you can isolate such stem cells and if you can repopulate them and you 
can uh, use those stem cells for uh, transplantation. I think it's even, again, it's even more complex and I think it's not really uh, realistic to translate this uh, into the clinical uh, practice for a lot of centers. But if you can, then you do not require immune suppression maybe, and you might have better results. But um, I think for stem cells, the key would be to, to um, produce the stem cells in the lab, in mass production, maybe even to induce them to more specific cell populations and then transplant those. So I'm not so convinced of the ontologous stem cell use. I, I hope that answers the question, but I'm not, um, I, do not, I do not know the details of this study. Maybe they have really nice results. Okay, know. okay, okay. Then uh, how about the INSPIRE study? In the US, so, not PS. Yes, so, in a so the graft, um, um, again, so grafting the lesion sites. So, um, if you uh, think about, so I do not, um, I do not know this this study uh, in detail, but the way grafts are typically used uh, are uh, in a chronic phase, chronic stage where the lesion there is already a lesion and there's a cystic cavity and there's a scar, and then you need something to bridge this. And in the acute uh, stage, it's really difficult for me to uh, to understand what the uh, the, the scaffold or the graft, sh what it should do. But um, maybe there's some new um, um, synthetic material that can nicely integrate and even um, you know um, can, can be used for sc as a scaffold in the long term. But the way this uh, typically has been used is in the more chronic phase. So. Um, no clear answer here, but um, so in, acute, in the acute stage, uncommon to use a graft. Okay, Dr. Yunzi, thank you very much. I think uh, most of the questions um, within the Q&A section have been answered, not all of them. Some surgical questions have been answered in between, I have seen, um, but there have been many more neurosurgical questions, no wonder, um, and this is a good sign. Um, there are still 130 participants uh, um, listening and watching. And this is also, I think, um, a great success. And I would like to thank in the end, again, the presenters, Professor Weitner, Dr. Isak, Dr. Yunzi for their presentations. I would like to um, thank the participants for joining us for a lively, well, it's uh, still an online uh, discussion, but uh, nevertheless, I think there were many interesting questions and maybe, um, and hopefully many of you have um, learned and realized a lot. Um, well, if not already done, join the EANS um, and um, have a nice evening. Hope to see or to listen to you soon again. Thank you again.